speaker is Brother Jesse Whitlock, and I read from his biography here that he calls Duncan, Oklahoma, his home. But we don't know, really know if that is his home. He just calls it his home. We don't even know if that's really Jesse or if he even exists. <laughs> he attended OCC in the Old Preston Road School of Preaching while under direction of the late brother Eldred Stevens. He entered his local work in 1970 in southwest Oklahoma as the associate minister to the late W.S. Boyd and then the late Albert C. Trent. He attended uh, the Old Elk City School of Preaching as both of those men served as instructors. And later he served as an instructor, instructor with the Westside School of Preaching at the invitation of the late brother J.T. Marlin. He's been involved in radio work, spent 33 years on the staff uh, at a, a number of Christian camps, has engaged two public debates, spoken on numerous brotherhood lectureships, including the spring lectureship here for several years, engages in gospel meetings annually, and has done mission uh, meetings in uh, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, etc. <laughs> I've never been to that state. <laughs> <laughs> He's done all of his uh, local work in Texas and Oklahoma, and he was married to uh, Terry Tilly in 2002, and they've now located the Event Church of Christ in Event, Texas, uh, having been with that congregation now for a year. Is that correct? So certainly uh, we welcome him to uh, come and speak to us. Uh, not a not an easy topic to speak on or to listen to. to have it spoke to you too about. But homosexuality didn't he make them male and female? Come speak to us, more Jesse. I do want to express my great appreciation to the elders of this congregation for this invitation. Also to Brother David Brown for allowing me to come and to be with you at this time. I would be remiss, and I really like that word, I don't know what it means, but I've heard my brother Dub use it and my other brother Dub use it, so I know it must be a good word. But I would be remiss if I did not express my appreciation to Jack and Brenda, not only for feeding a bunch of preachers this afternoon, but also for uh, offering to me the hospitality of their home. I appreciate that so very, very much. To David, I want to say I appreciate that for all of these years, this lectureship has been hosted in honor of my birthday. Uh, tomorrow is my birthday, February 24th. And for those of you who might be wondering, chocolate cake is still one of my favorites. <laughs> but if you don't have time to fix a chocolate cake between now and tomorrow, I will accept cash. <laughs> As has been mentioned, As has been mentioned, we have a very serious moral threat facing our nation. This was brought out in a subject on abortion by Brother Doug just a very short while ago. Another one of many, many moral issues that confront our nation is that subject that I am asked to address tonight. When Hussein Obama was running for the office of president, Hussein sought the support of voters in the homosexual community, and as you know, he received that full support. In a 770-word letter posted on his campaign website, Hussein used the acronym LGBT, standing for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, six times. He wrote, and I quote, as your president, I will use the bully pulpit to urge states to treat same-sex couples with full equality in their family and adoption laws. 
I also believe that the federal government should not stand in the way of states that want to decide on their own how best to pursue equality for gay and lesbian couples. Whether that means a domestic partnership, a civil union, or a civil marriage, unquote. In a September Democratic debate, Hussein said that he would be supportive of teachers reading to their students, second graders, a book, King and King, supportive of gay marriage. At least 40 states have now passed laws which prohibit gay marriage. In that same letter, Hussein Obama wrote, and I quote, I believe that we can achieve the goal of full equality for the millions of LGBT people in this country. We will achieve real equality for all Americans, gay and straight alike. I have co-sponsored bills that would equalize tax treatment for same-sex couples. Federal law should not discriminate in any way against gay and lesbian couples. I talked about the need to fight homophobia when I announced my candidacy for president." Unquote. Homosexuality is defined as sexual relations between individuals of the same sex. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, all such occasions are treated by, as sin by God. There are no exceptions to that rule. Most are familiar with the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah as we go back to Genesis chapter 19, beginning in verse 14 and 4 and following. The sin of Sodom was very grievous according to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 20. I once heard a gay rights supporter contend that the story was found in the Old Testament and that it could not even be substantiated within the pages of the New Testament. Well, he spoke out of his ignorance, as does our new president, Hussein Obama. Jesus Christ confirmed the entire episode in, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. If you will turn to Jude, verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Then in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, we have more uh, teaching in the pages of the New Testament where Peter penned, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. President Hussein Obama has declared war on every New Testament Christian in America. Hours, I said hours after becoming president, the White House government website laid out Hussein's agenda for his term in office. Under the heading of civil rights, we find his plans for the homosexuals and the lesbians. He will expand so-called hate crimes. These, uh, these will now include extra punishment, extra punishment for crimes committed because of sexual orientation. Now that goes back to the LGBT acronym. He calls for repeal of the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, which allows for marriage being only between a man and a woman, sort of like Adam and Eve in the very beginning. He wants a repeal of the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. Hussein, quote, thinks that a child will benefit from a healthy and loving home, whether the parents are gay or not, unquote. Peter said in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. Our new president has indeed declared war on every Bible-believing citizen in our country. Hussein is already using that bully pulpit of his presidency to attack anyone who would dare to, de who would dare to declare what the Word of God declares on the subject that we're going to look at so very briefly in our study that tonight. Hussein's agenda is pro-homosexual in every way. He is well known for his history of support towards hate crimes. A Texas pair, two men, were fined under a Texas sodomy law. They sued the state of Texas, took that suit to the Supreme Court of the United States. The United States Supreme Court ruled six to three against the state of Texas. The court declared the sodomy laws of the state of Texas as unconstitutional. So you see, brethren, it's getting a lot closer to us 
than we might like to even want to think about or imagine. In 2006, David and Tanya Parker of Massachusetts had their son to come home from kindergarten carrying a book that the teacher had given to him. Who's in a Family was the title of the book by Robert Scotch. The book is all about Clifford and his partner, another man. The, Parker, the Parkers were infuriated. They went to their son's teacher. They wanted to know why they had not been informed that such a book was going to be given to their five-year-old son. They, they were told by the teacher that the school board had decided this was not a parental notification matter. This was not a parental notification matter. Well, the Parkers went to the next school meeting. David insisted that he and his wife should have been told before such a book was given out to five-year-old kids. Well, the meeting went on and on. The meeting became a little bit heated. To make a long story short, David Parker spent the night in jail. That's in Massachusetts, one of the 50 United States of America. Also, I want you to note that in our school classrooms today, books like these are now making their way. My Two Uncles, Daddy's Roommate, Heather Has Two Mommies, One Dad, Two Dads, and that list of books can be extended. Those are books that are now in public school classrooms all across America. Jehovah described the corruption of the land of Israel by specifying their numerous sins. Oftentimes you will go to a list of those sins and you will find this statement, the Sodomites were in the land. Judges 19, 22, 1 Kings 14, verse 24. When time came for cleansing of the land, God said that the Sodomites would have to be removed. Look at 1 Kings 15, 22, 1 Kings 22, 46. Uh, 2 Kings 23, 7. Under the law of Moses, did God accept, God would not accept certain gifts that were given to him, namely the wages of a whore or the earning of a dog, a sodomite, a homosexual. Their worship was not acceptable to Jehovah God. That principle remains true to this very day. In Proverbs 14, uh, in Proverbs 14, 34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And America needs to wake up and realize that we are not the exception to the rule. We are not the exception to the rule. We, like any other nation that God has taken down, can be taken down. And if we allow the initials of USA to stand for United Sodomites of America, what will God do to us? as a nation. And if he does not do so, then does he owe an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah? The homosexuals in our land today are still a reproach to us, including President Hussein Obama, who has declared war on any citizen of the land who would dare to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Word of God. I cannot speak for you but I am reminded of the words of Joshua. In Joshua 24, 15, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 27. And the rib which Jehovah God had made the rib which Jehovah God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Genesis 2.22 Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2 verse 24 I submit to you that you would have to have a little professional help to misunderstand the meaning of those clear-cut passages in the Word of God. God made them, plural, male and female. Notice that the text teaches us that a man must leave his father and his mother. Not his father and his father. Not his mother and his mother. He must leave father and mother and then cleave unto his wife. And there is one very stubborn fact that all the homosexuals and all the politicians and all the lesbians of the world combined can never ever change. Two homosexuals 
have never, ever brought a baby child into this world. Two lesbians have never, ever brought a baby child into this world. This one fact remains undaunted by all the arguments in defense of the sin of homosexuality that one can hope to ever hear. If you go to Funk and Wagnalls, 1979, we have these following helpful definitions. Homosexual, quote, of or having sexual desire for persons of the same sex. Lesbian, quote, a homosexual woman. Sodom, quote, in the Bible, a city on the Dead Sea, destroyed with the city of Gomorrah because of the wickedness of the people. Genesis 13.10. Sodomy, quote, unnatural sexual relations, especially between male persons or between a human being and an animal. We are losing the war on the acceptability of homosexuality in our nation. Men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. They reject the Bible because it contradicts them. And this is the reason that the homosexuals and the lesbians are rejecting the Word of God and the authority of God's Word. What do the Scriptures have to say about the sin of homosexuality? And by the way, several times in the manuscript you will notice that I refer to homosexuality as a sin. I do not apologize for that. I am not going to change that statement. Homosexuality is a sin. It has always been a sin. It will ever remain a sin. And there is nothing that any one of us can do or any of the homosexual community can do or any of the lesbians can do that is going to change that fact. I want to approach this very briefly from the three ages or dispensation of the Bible. I want to begin with the patriarchal age. Jesus Christ himself, in referencing the patriarchal dispensation, queried, Have you not read that he who made or created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5. In this very simple statement, we see that from the very beginning of time, God has never approved of the sin of homosexuality or lesbianism. On occasion, I've had certain ones to contend that Jesus Christ never spoke one word against the sin of homosexuality. That is when their attention needs to be directed to Matthew chapter 19 and verses 1 through 9. Those verses speak eloquently against the sin of homosexuality. And then we have this inspired notice within the pages of Holy Writ. In Genesis 13, 13, Now the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners against Jehovah exceedingly. The Holy Spirit early on has informed us of the fact that the inhabitants of Sodom were exceedingly wicked men. Exceedingly wicked. What would cause the Holy Spirit of God to so identify the inhabitants of sinful Sodom. Well, let's focus our attention very briefly to Genesis chapter 18, chapter 19. In the 18th chapter of Genesis, three men came to Abraham and informed him that Sarah was going to be giving birth to a son. It was at that time that they also informed him of the great wickedness of sinful Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jehovah God said in Genesis 18, 20, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. We need to underscore those two words at the end of that verse. Very grievous. This is God's description of the sin of homosexuality. And then you know that later the angels go to Lot's house, and even though there is a mob scene gathering around Lot's house, demanding to have relations with the what they believe are men, ordinary men, the angels strike the mob scene with miraculous blindness. And even though every man in that mob has been stricken blind in a miraculous manner, the text still says they pressed sore in the King James Version. They pressed hard, New King James Version, or wearied themselves in the American Standard Version to break down the door. So we see a very strong indication of just how persistent and how perverse the sin of homosexuality is in that description. 
Genesis 19, verse 24 informs us, And Jehovah reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Jehovah out of heaven. I want to hasten on across several notes here and go to the, to the Mosaical age. Did God have a change of heart or a change of mind when it was time for the law of Moses to be enacted? Well, let your fingers do the walking and let the Bible do the talking. In Leviticus chapter 18 and the verses 22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. And then in Leviticus chapter 20 and the verses 13, If a man lie with mankind as with womankind, both of them have committed abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, an abomination is described by the Hebrew scholars as unlawful, hateful, offensive, unclean. Turn to Deuteronomy 23, verse 17. There shall be no prostitute of the daughters of Israel, neither shall, be, shall there be a sodomite of the sons of Israel. So God disdained this abominable practice of homosexuality throughout the time of the law of Moses. Now God would frequently describe the corruption of Israel by enumerating her sins. Now oftentimes, as we have noted previously, there would be sodomites in the land, 1 Kings 14, 24, 1 Kings 15, 12, 1 Kings 22, 46. But in the reforms of good King Josiah, we read in 2 Kings chapter 23 and the verse 7 of how he break down the houses of the sodomites. Now, when we come to Deuteronomy 23, 17 and 18, there are a couple of things that need to be brought to our attention. There shall be no prostitute of the daughters of Israel, neither shall there be a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot or the wages of a dog into the house of Jehovah thy God for any vow, for even both these are an abomination unto Jehovah thy God. Now, if you are following in the King James Version, here is what you read in verse 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. The New King James Version is going to read in this fashion. There shall be no ritual harlot of the daughters of Israel, or a perverted one of the sons of Israel. Now, where the ASV of 1901 in Deuteronomy 23:18 has the wages of a dog, both the King James and the New King James reads the price of a dog. Now I want to contrast the reliable renderings of the American Standard Version, the King James Version, and even the New King James Version with the per version known as the NIV, which stands for non-inspired version. <laughs> the NIV specifies, no Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. You must not bring the earnings of a female prostitute or of a male prostitute into the house of the Lord your God to pay any vow, because the Lord your God detests them both. Notice the sodomite, or the perverted one, has now become a male prostitute. Now, the Hebrew will certainly allow for this rendering, and that's not what I'm contesting now. Male prostitutes in the old pagan temples were oftentimes referred to as dogs. Now, have you ever wondered why the NIV changed that sodomite or that perverted one into a male prostitute? It is just possible that the NIV's Old Testament chairman, Martin Woodstra, exerted his influence on this translation. You see, Mr. Woodstra is a very strong supporter of homosexuality. Now, let's, let's consider this just a little further. Without are the dogs and the sorcerers and the fornicators and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone that loveth and maketh the lie. Revelation 22, verse 15. Now, if you have the King James Version, the New King James Version, the NIV, all of those will read dogs when you come to Revelation 22, 15. The stance of God is that the sodomite will not enter into heaven. Now I've got to tell you, when I was a boy preacher, still had hair and everything, I used to wonder about Revelation 22:15. I could understand sorcerers and fornicators and murderers and idolaters and 
all the liars, not being able to enter heaven. But frankly, I did not understand without are the dogs, the homosexual, who will not repent of the sin of homosexuality, will not be able to enter heaven. When Paul penned, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the concision, Philippians 3 verse 2, again, we can understand all of that but the dogs. You see, when we see that word dogs, we think about those cute little four-legged puppies running around in our home that we love so dearly and treat sometimes better than our children. And, and that's not what we're talking about. That's not what is under discussion. Dogs was a term of derision. And he goes back to some of those uh, very things that we have been discussing. The term sodomite is the equivalent of saying homosexual. Listen to Webster's Dictionary as it defines sodomite. Quote, one who practices sodomy. He then defines the word sodomy. Quote, the homosexual proclivities of the men of the city in Genesis 19, 1 through 11. Definition 1, copulation with a member of the same sex or with an animal. Unquote. It would be safe to say that a man lying with an animal, or could we say a dog, would be guilty of sodomy. It would be safe to conclude that a man lying with another man would also be guilty of sodomy. And now we begin to understand why Mr. Woodstra was so insistent that that word sodomite be changed, be altered in some form. Mr. Woodstra must have been out of town when the translation committee went to work on Judges 19.22. I want you to listen to the NIV from, uh, from this very text. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house. Pounding on the door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, Bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. Notice the NIV admits that these men who are wanting to have these improper relations with a man my friend, that practice is the sin of homosexuality. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And they are called wicked. It was wicked hands that crucified the Son of God. As I read in Acts 2, verse 23, Paul commanded the Corinthians to put away the wicked man from among themselves. 1 Corinthians 5, 13. Paul reminded the Colossians that they had been alienated because of their wicked works, Colossians 1, 21. Paul beseeched the prayers of the Thessalonians that he might be delivered from the wicked in 2 Thessalonians 3, 2. And Peter tells us that righteous Lot was delivered from wicked men, 2 Peter 2, 7. Peter also warns us not to be led away with the error of the wicked, 2 Peter 3, 17. Don't you get it? Wicked people will not enter heaven. Wicked men or women cannot enter a heavenly home. But every time that we become involved in discussions that have to do either with the patriarchal age or the mosaical age, you will barely get into that discussion before someone comes up and says, well, we're under the Christian dispensation. Those are Old Testament law. And they are not binding or authoritative upon us. And of course, all in this audience understand that argument. But Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And hopefully, we can learn some things from the teaching of the Old Testament on the sin of homosexuality to understand why under the Christian age or dispensation, the time in which we live homosexuality is still a sin. The gospel is relevant because homosexuality is prevalent. Jesus Christ said, Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh? Matthew 19, 4 and 5. Now notice, it is the Christ of creation who is speaking on this occasion. And he states that he made them in the beginning as male and female. Now there is not one page of Holy Writ from Genesis to Revelation 
where you are going to read anywhere after the fashion that in the beginning God made them male and male, or that in the beginning God made them female and female. After God had created the man and the woman, not two men, not two women, what is it that God said to Adam and Eve that he could not have said to Adam and Steve? In Genesis 1:28, God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then I want you to watch this as we drop down to verse 31. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Previously, we have seen this expression. God looked upon his creation, and it was good. Go back to Genesis 1, verse 4, then verse 10, verse 13, verse 18, verse 21, verse 25. Then in Genesis 1:26 through 30, we have the account of God's creating the man and then the woman for the man. And only then, only after the woman is brought and presented to the man, does God look upon his great creative powers in the very beginning. And he looks upon his creation and says, it was very good. It was very good. Prior to that, it's always good. Also, I want you to observe this. When Adam and Eve were placed in that garden, that perfect paradise, have you ever thought about this? Adam could not have practiced the sin of homosexuality even if he had desired to do so. Eve could not have practiced the sin of lesbianism even if she had desired to do so. Because in the beginning, there was male and female, Adam and Eve. In Romans 1, the Apostle Paul deals at great length with the Gentiles' need of righteousness. It is rather obvious that all of mankind today stands in need of righteousness. It is becoming more and more apparent to us as citizens of this nation that we stand in a nation that is in need of righteousness. Paul warned, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, Romans 1, Now, Paul has somewhat to say about these self-professed fools. Drop down to verse 24. Wherefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts and uncleanness that their bodies should be dishonored among themselves. Now, Americans realize that a link exists between the practice of sexual uh, promiscuity and many VDs that we experience today. But I want us to look, look very closely to Romans 1, verses 26 and 27. For this cause God gave them up into vile passions, for the women changed the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another. Men with men, working unseemliness, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was due. Now notice God describes these passions as being vile. And I do mean vile. What I find utterly amazing is the fact that many of my brethren cannot understand the clear warning and words of the Apostle Paul. While those who are so in love with this world and the things of this world have no difficulty whatsoever in doing. I want to preface this next statement. It is my studied conviction that the New International Version and the Living Bible paraphrased are two of the most unreliable versions or translations on the market today. Having said that, I want you to listen to Romans 1, 26, 27 twice more. The NIV states, Even their women exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with the women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversions. Now from the Living Bible paraphrase, even their women turned against God's natural plan for them and indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having a normal sex relationship with women, burned with lust for each other. Men doing shameful things with other men 
and as a result getting paid within their own souls with the penalty they so richly deserve. Now, friend of mine, you do not have to own a set of the annual Denton Lectureship books edited by Brother Dub McClish in order to understand what those passages are saying, even in those perversions. It is well known that the sin of homosexuality was a common practice in ancient Rome. Many, many commentaries on uh, the Book of Romans suggest that the due recompense of error was some sort of dreaded and deadly disease of that time. Uh, read some of the writings of Moses, Moses Lord, David Lipscomb, J.W. Shepard, Roy Deaver, E.M. Zur, and the list goes on. Today we've given a name to that dreaded disease, the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or, or the AIDS virus. Our nation has spent literally millions and millions of your tax dollars and mine in a futile effort to discover a cure to the AIDS virus. Our new president has said that he is willing to spend billions of your tax dollars and mine, again, in a futile effort to discover the cure to the AIDS virus. You see, so often sinners want to enjoy their sin and not have to suffer the consequences for their sin. I'm going to give to you, actually God is going to give to you, the cure to the AIDS virus. It's very simple. One man with one woman for one lifetime, each being faithful to the other. And in one generation, the AIDS virus will start to disappear. God has always counted homosexuality as an abomination in his sight. He has always recognized marriage between a male and a female who were both eligible to be married. Genesis 2.24, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2. Our English word homosexual is not derived from the Latin homo, which means man, but from the Greek word, which means the same, the same. This is the transgression of God's law that we can see from Genesis to Revelation in all three ages or dispensations. When this one truth comes shining through, procreation cannot originate between a man and a man. Procreation cannot take place between a woman and a woman. God intended from the very beginning one man and one woman for one lifetime, Genesis 2:18 through 24. Homosexuality is clearly condemned in the New Testament, Romans 1, verses 18 through 27. We have noticed that the cities of the plain were destroyed because of the evil practice of the sin of homosexuality. Nowhere in the Bible do we read of entire regions being destroyed because that region is infected with thieves or drunkards or liars or even murderers. At one time, the entire earth was destroyed by the floodwaters of Noah's day. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. Much later, we read of the destruction of sinful Sodom. Jesus Christ described the times of Noah as he gave warning as to what it would be like at the time of his final return. If you'll turn to Luke uh, chapter 17, verse 27, they ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. The King James Version reads, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Now in the time of Noah, it is quite apparent that they were, mar that they were marrying and giving their children in marriage. The Lord then describes the wickedness that took place at the time of the destruction of sinful Sodom. If you'll drop down to the very next verse, notice carefully what our Lord says. Likewise, even as it came to pass in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Do you see what happened here? Jesus Christ is comparing the time of wickedness at the time of the floodwaters of Noah's day, and then he is describing the wickedness at the time of the destruction of sinful Sodom. Both lists start out with exactly the same two comparisons. They ate, they drank, but then where in the first list it says they married wives, they were given in marriage, he does away with that likeness. He says they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. Now, have you ever wondered why there is such a discrepancy? Both times the people were engaged in sin. 
Both times the people are described as being wicked in the sight of God, but in Sodom they were not marrying and giving their wives, their, their children and wives, giving their children to be married. They were not doing that. Why not? The answer is really very simple. Homosexuals and or lesbians cannot be married in God's sight. Homosexuals and lesbians cannot be married in God's sight. That's why Jesus does not use the same comparison. In the beginning, God made them male and female. He did not make them Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve. A union between two men or a union between two women does not make a marriage. The late brother Ronald Reagan, I'm sorry, the late president Ronald Reagan said, quote, I have wondered at times what the Ten Commandments would have looked like if Moses had run them through Congress. <laughs> you know, if he were still alive today, he would have a pretty good picture of what they would look like. He also said, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Those words may prove to be much more prophetic than any of us dare to think or imagine. Senator Obama mocked the book of Deuteronomy, which has somewhat to say about the sin of homosexuality. Then he made fun of the book of Leviticus, which also has somewhat to say on this sin of homosexuality. And finally, he even ridiculed and mocked the Sermon on the Mount. Now, he did this at a, uh, at, at a dinner where he was receiving lots of applause and lots of laughter, and then he mockingly made this statement. Folks have not been reading their Bible. Well, now it is apparent to us that President Hussein Obama and those who are following in his footsteps are not reading or studying or comprehending the message of God's Word when it comes to the sin of homosexuality. Homosexuality is something that we have made legal in this nation, but we can never, ever make it right. We can make it legal, but we can never make it right. There is a movie slated to come to America entitled Corpus Christi. It depicts my Lord and his apostles as homosexuals. New Testament Christians need to be up in arms. It is slated to be released here sometime this summer. And in the manuscript that you have in the book, you will read a segment uh, in that chapter about McDonald's and their support of homosexuality. Uh, I don't remember the page number right offhand, but like the late great brother Marshall Keeble once said when he was preaching, and he had given a text, and one of the brethren pointed out he had given an improper text, and he said, well, I know it's in there, just keep reading and you'll run into it. Well, you do that with my lectureship book. You just keep reading and you'll run into it. The good news, McDonald's has had a change of heart. Those things that are written in that chapter are no longer true about McDonald's, and I'm thankful for that. Paul was correcting the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6. I, want to be, uh, I will be using the New King James Version as we bring this lesson to its close. The New King James Version says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, the New King James Version rendering of nor homosexuals nor sodomites, even the liberal NIV says homosexual offenders, 
Even the uh, very unfortunate translation known as the Living Bible Paraphrase reads, homosexuals will have no share in his kingdom. Now that is the, it, precisely the message of the Apostle Paul. Paul's penetrating point in both of these passages is that those who practice such things, things like homosexuality and lesbianism and all of those other things that we find enumerated, will not, shall not, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Paul recognized his responsibility as a gospel preacher. All preachers of the gospel must strive to imitate the apostle Paul in this regard. We must mark sin, but when it comes to this sin of homosexuality, let us inform homosexuals and lesbians of the good and the glorious news of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. Any sinner, including the homosexual, including the lesbian, including those who have entered into so-called same-sex marriages, can be forgiven. They can put away all of that past sin. They can become New Testament Christians and have all past sin washed away. We do not have the right or the prerogative to ignore certain sins. We do not have the right nor the prerogative to ignore certain sinners and simply go beyond the teaching of the Great Commission of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I shall not be listed among those preachers who are attempting to sanction the sin of homosexuality, nor will I be in that number who will simply pass by on the other side and say nothing and do nothing. We need to reach out with the power of the gospel message to those who are lost in sin regardless of what that sin is. In Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We need to be like John, who said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Any sinner can have remission of that sin, as he is willing to repent of that sin. Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. Repent means to turn away from to have nothing more to do with, to simply leave it alone, to walk away from that sin. We must make the good confession of 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we can be buried in the watery grave of baptism, where we can come into contact with the cleansing blood of the Lamb of God. When we do that, as, as we read in Romans chapter 6, the opening verses of that chapter, then we are added to the church by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Acts 2 and verse 47. There may be one in this assembly tonight who desires to become a New Testament Christian, to have all past sin washed away. There may be an erring child of God's tonight. You may have sinned in such a way as to bring reproach upon the precious name of the church for which our Lord and Savior died upon that cross. It may be that this very evening you desire the prayers of brothers and sisters in Christ if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. If there is one who needs to respond to heaven's invitation this evening in any public way, why not now, as together we stand and as we sing this song?